everybody here. And, yeah. So, uh, okay. If you'd all like to turn in your Bibles to John chapter 6, verse 38, uh, this morning. John 6, 38. We've been ready here to start. Pray first. Father, thank you so much for your word this morning. Lord, what darkness we would be in if we didn't have the light of your word. We thank you for it now. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, John chapter 6, verse 38. For I came down from heaven, not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. This is the Father's will which has sent me, that of all which he hath given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. This is the will of him that sent me, that everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life. And I'll raise him up at the last day. The Jews then murmured at him because he said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. And they said, Is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How is it then that he saith, I came down from heaven? Jesus therefore answered and said unto them, Murmur not among yourselves. No man can come to me except the Father which has sent me. Draw him, and I'll raise him up in the last days. It's written in the prophets, and they shall be all taught of God. Every man therefore that hath heard and hath learned of the Father cometh unto me. Now, we're in a place in this chapter where Jesus has made an astounding statement that no other rabbi had ever made. He's made a statement about himself that no other prophet has ever made about himself. He stated something about himself no other man has said about himself, and it did not go unnoticed. As a matter of fact, after Jesus said this about himself, it appears that no one heard anything else. And that that statement that Jesus made about himself, which was so astounding, is in verse 38, when he just said, I came down from heaven. No one ever said that about himself, ever before, that he came down from heaven. And after Jesus said that, in verse 38, Jesus went on to say, that he came down to do the will of him that sent him. And he went on in verse 40 to make a, this great statement about the will of God who sent him, that God the Father wanted Jesus to save man and raise him up to be with him forever in heaven on the day of resurrection. And he went on marvelously to say other things in verse 41 to describe, really to characterize this wonderful love of God who wants everyone to see who Jesus really is and believe into Jesus and have this this life that's going to last forever with no end. And this, uh, as I mentioned, and again, he repeats this marvelous raising of the dead to go to heaven for eternity. These are beautiful pearls of truth that, that about God, about heaven, that Jesus has brought to the people in these verses. And because the message that Jesus brought to the people from from heaven what was what they wanted, what they asked for. He told them in verse 33 that there was a bread that he called the bread from God that came down from heaven. He said that this bread is eaten that it would give to the world, the, the, those who eat it, everlasting life. So that sounded great to the people. And the response of the people was, give us the bread. In verse 34, verse 34, then said they unto him, Lord, evermore, give us this bread. So what they were saying in verse 34 was, please, 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 give us this bread of God that you're talking about, that if we eat it, we're going to have eternal life. But when the people got that news, that God had sent them the bread of heaven, that would give them everlasting life, they, their response, should have been the same response that their dying ancestors who were in Egypt were being worked to death to build these pyramids 
and, and they were really set in Egypt into a state of sighing and crying in Exodus 2.23, Exodus 2.23. It came to pass in the process of time the king of Egypt died and the children of Israel sighed by reason of the bondage and they cried and their cry came up unto God by reason of the bondage. So in Egypt, the ancestors, the Jewish people, they sighed and they cried because there was this cruel, hard bondage and they were killing all the male babies. And the Bible says that their sighs and their cries came up into the ears of God. And like the people around Jesus, they were also under a cruel bondage of the Romans. And they were in a sense sighing and crying. And in Egypt, back in Egypt, God's response to the sighs and the cries of the Jewish people was to send a deliverance named Moses. And when Moses arrived, the response of the people in Egypt was Exodus 4.29, Exodus 4.29, and Moses and Aaron went and gathered together all the elders of the children of Israel. And Aaron spoke all the words which the Lord had spoken unto Moses and did the signs in the sight of the people. And the people believed, and when they heard that the Lord had visited the children of Israel and that he had looked upon their affliction, then they bowed their heads and worshipped. The, the Jewish people in Egypt saw the signs that authenticated that Moses was God's response to their dilemma. They found, they found themselves in Egypt. And when the people saw that God sent Moses to deliver them, their response was simply, Exodus 4.31, Exodus 4.31, they bowed their heads and worshipped. Now, just as it was then in Egypt, the Jewish people in Galilee were sighing and crying under the oppression of the Romans, God sent their deliverer, not Moses, but Jesus, he did miracles, just like Moses, to authenticate his claim that he was sent by God to deliver them. And was the response, this is the question, and was the response of the Jewish people in Galilee like their ancestors in Egypt? Did the Jewish people in Galilee do what their ancestors did in Exodus 4.31, Exodus 4.31, bowed their heads and worshiped? Sadly, the answer is no. Instead of bowing their heads and worshiping, their response is verse 41, verse 41. The Jews then murmured at him because he said, I'm the bread which came down from heaven. They had pleaded with Jesus in verse 34, give us this bread of God that's going to give us everlasting life. They were so ready to receive that bread and eat that bread that they could give eternal life. Yes, they wanted that. But when they heard what that bread of life was, they did an about face, about face and they said, oh no, oh no. When they heard Jesus say in verse 35, verse 35, Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. When they heard that the bread of life was Jesus himself, they said, no, 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 no. Anyone but Jesus, anything but Jesus, not Jesus. Even though Jesus had told them in verse 35 that if they came to him as the bread of life, that they were going to never hunger in their soul again, never going to thirst. Even though he told them in verse 35 that the bread of life was going to take all their thirst and their soul away. Even though all of that, the hurdle in verse 35 of Jesus saying, I am the bread of life was too high for them to get over. And that's when it came out. The person of Jesus was tolerated in order to get the free food, the free the, the, the healings. But when they heard that to get the everlasting life, they had to come to Jesus and become united to the person of Jesus, they said, 
that's over the top. That's beyond the limit of our toleration. And their response was, verse 41, verse 41, the Jews murmured at it. Now, we have to pause at this point and really address this term, which is so used in the book of John. And it's the term, the Jews, the Jews. This term, the Jews, is used more in the Gospel of John than any of the other three Gospels. I'll just give you an idea. Matthew uses the term the Jews in five verses. Mark uses the term the Jews in six verses. Luke uses the term the Jews in five verses. But John uses the term the Jews in 64 verses. So what are we to make of this? By using the term the Jews, is John anti-Semitic? That's a question. By using the term the Jews, John is not referring to all the Jews because John is a Jew. John himself is a Jew. So by using the term the Jews, we have to understand that John is driving the point of how the religious leaders of the Jewish people had successfully influenced the majority, but not all, because John's Jew, the majority of the Jewish people. So rather than to say the religious, Jew, the religious leaders of the Jews, John just says the Jews. Now, so John says in verse 41, verse 41, the Jews then murmured against him because he had said, I'm the bread which came down from heaven. They murmured, which means that they didn't openly oppose what Jesus said about himself. They privately whispered among themselves. And with that private whisper, they effectively instilled in the minds of the majority of the people a solid prejudice against Jesus Christ. Now, this is what the rabbis do. The rabbis instill a prejudice against Jesus. And this is what the 56 summer blitzers are up against right now and battling across the U.S. for these 12 weeks in, in this year. And they, they are battling against an instilled prejudice against Jesus Christ. It's an irrational prejudice that Jesus described as a hatred without a cause in John 15, 25. John 15, 25. He said, or it said, this come at the pass that the word might be fulfilled that is written in their law. They hated me without a cause. Now, that was a prophetic prediction of what the response of the people, the Jewish people would be of a hatred without a cause that was spoken by King David in Psalm 119, 161. Psalm 119, 161. The princes have persecuted me without a cause. It says, this prejudice that the rabbis instill, in, and not just the rabbis, but that the rabbis do instill in the people is what God says that it's the reason why God says, I am against the rabbis. I am against and he calls them the shepherds in Ezekiel 34.10. Ezekiel 34.10. Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against the shepherds, and I will require my flock at their hand, and cause them to cease from feeding the flock. Neither shall the shepherds feed themselves anymore, for I'll deliver my flock from their mouth, that they may not be meat for them. I have rabbi friends, and I've told them, you have an opportunity and a responsibility. I tell them, I said, just because you have been born into and you have been trained into this prejudice against Jesus Christ, that that's not relieve you from both the opportunity and the responsibility by God to take your people to love Jesus Christ and cast off that prejudice because they've got an opportunity. They've got a congregation. Try and point the Jewish people 
to their God, saying, behold your God, as it says in Isaiah, and point to Jesus. But instead, it promoted the Jewish people a prejudice against their only hope. <clears throat> okay, now, in verse 41, it's clear that the murmur was not against the bread of God that could give them eternal life. The murmur was against Jesus, as it says in verse 41, the Jews murmured at him. It was directed against him. Many people today, they don't have a problem with the teachings of Jesus. The Sermon on the Mount is hailed as great teaching. The problem many people have is when Jesus taught about who he was. Specifically, when Jesus says these words, I am. We all know the, 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 the I am. That's what triggered the hatred of Jesus. For example, when Jesus said in John 8, 58, John 8, 58, Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. Then took, the, then took they up stones to cast at him. But Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. So when Jesus claimed that he was the great I am, the I am, who met Moses in the burning bush, the great I am who brought the Jewish people out of Egypt, destroyed Egypt to deliver them, the great I am who fed the Jewish people for 40 years in the, in, in, in the desert, gave them water out of rocks, then parted the Red Sea for them to escape the Egyptians, then gave them the law in Mount Sinai, it was this great I am God who did all those things for the people. So when Jesus claimed to be that great I am God, the Jews took up stones to stone. And when Jesus said that he and God the Father were one, the Jews tried to kill him. And at that point, Jesus asked them, why are you trying to kill me? And they told him. In John 10 30, John 10 30, when Jesus said, I and my Father are one, then the Jews took up stones again. Again. To kill him. Jesus answered them, Many good works have I showed you from my Father. For which of those works do you stone me? The Jews answered him, saying, For a good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy, because that thou, being a man, makest thyself God. The opposite was true. Thou being God, make us thyself man. But and that's what they said. It was because they understood that Jesus was claiming to be God. That was the reason they sought to kill Jesus. And this is the issue. As long as Jesus stays within the realm of a human teacher, a prophet even, they can tolerate Jesus. But when they hear Jesus claim that he was God who came down from heaven and became a man to save them when they heard that Jesus claimed to be God, then they bent over and reached for the stones to kill him. And that's, that's what they heard when Jesus told them that he came down from heaven. They heard loud and clear that Jesus was claiming to be God, he claimed to be God. And that offended them. And when, because when he claimed his origin was from heaven, they knew he was claiming to be the person that Daniel prophesied about, that Daniel said he saw in Daniel 7.13. Daniel 7.13, when, when Daniel said this, I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came the Ancient of Days. Daniel told him, there was a person in heaven who was man, called the Son of Man, and, and who, who had come to the Ancient of Days, which in the Ancient of Days it, it means no beginning. It was, it, that's the in the beginning God was. And when Jesus said in verse 38, he came down from heaven, they knew that Jesus was claiming to be that Daniel 9, 7, 13, uh, Daniel 7.13, Daniel 7.13, 
that son of man who came to the, the ancient of days. And this is the great offense that fuels the prejudice against Jesus. It's that he's God. The Bible calls this offense a, a, a stumbling block in, in, in 1 Corinthians 1.23. 1 Corinthians 1.23, when it says that we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block and unto the Greeks foolishness. Especially when we preach that God, that, that God became a man so he could become the Lamb of God to be sacrificed for our sins on the cross. When we say that, we are preaching Christ as a stumbling block. And the image of, of a stumbling block is that the person is just walking along and, 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 and he's tracking with us as we're, what we're saying, and he's saying, yeah, that's true. Until we come to the subject of the cross, and then all of a sudden the person trips and falls. You just can't handle that. Like the Muslim priest said to me, can God die <laughs> on the cross for our sins? When Simeon took the child, the little child, Jesus in his arms, he said to Mary in Luke 2.34, Luke 2.34, Simeon blessed them and said unto Mary his mother, Behold, this child is set for the fall and rising again of many in Israel and for a sign which shall be spoken against. So what he said, what, what Simeon said was that God sent Jesus among the Jewish people and many would fall into this prejudice against Jesus. But Simeon also said that many would recover from that prejudice and they would get back up again. And so God the Father said that he would place Jesus in the world and Jesus in the world would either be a sanctuary that lost souls could run into for safety or they would stumble at Jesus and he described they would fall, they would be broken, and they would land right in the devil's trap that opens up. It's like a trap door into hell. This is Isaiah 8.14, Isaiah 8.14. He shall be for a sanctuary, but for a stone of stumbling, and for a rock of offense to both the houses of Israel, for a gin or a trap, and for a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and many among them shall stumble and fall and be broken and be snared and be taken. Now, for the Jews who suffer with this instilled prejudice against Jesus, Getting over this prejudice against Jesus, accepting that Jesus is God, is a hard hurdle to overcome, but it's worth it. Because the G Jesus said about getting over this prejudice against him in Matthew 11, 6, of Matthew 11, 6, Blessed is he whosoever shall not be offended in me. So when Isaiah 8, 15 says, many among them are going to stumble and fall and be broken, and snared and be taken. What Jesus was saying in Matthew eleven sixteen, 16, Matthew eleven sixteen, 16, blessed is he, whosoever shall not be offended in me. He's saying this, blessed are the few who will dare to go against the majority and worship Jesus as God. As it says in Romans 9, 33, Romans 9, 33, as, as it's written, behold, I lay in Zion, a stumbling block and a rock of offense, and whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Blessed are the few who will stand alone like Abraham did and say to Jesus like Thomas did in John 20, 28, John 20, 28, my Lord and my God. So what we see in verse 41 is not those who follow Jesus, uh, follow Thomas at this point, calling Jesus my Lord and my God. We see murmuring. And murmuring is like a cancer that does not stay contained. It spreads. Murmuring makes a person bitter. Like when the Israelites came to those waters that were bitter in the desert in Exodus 15.22, Exodus 15.22. So Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea and they went out into the wilderness of Shur and they went three days in the wilderness and found no water. And when they came to Marah, which means bitter, 
They could not drink the waters of Mara because they were bitter. Therefore, the name of it was called Mara. And the people murmured against Moses saying, what shall we drink? And he cried unto the Lord and the Lord showed him a tree, which when he had cast into the waters, the waters were made sweet. And there he made for them a statute and an ordinance, and there he proved them. So those bitter waters of Mara, they represent for us hard times in our lives, tough things to deal with that we encounter in our lives. And God showed Moses a tree, and he told Moses, throw that tree into those waters, and Moses did it, and the waters converted, they transformed, they became, they went from being bitter to being sweet. <laughs> now, Jesus was crucified on a tree. The Bible says, cursed is the one who hangs on a tree. That's Jesus. He was, he was crucified on a tree. The cross is a tree that represents the, 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 the tree represents the cross. And the lesson for us is that when we come to a bitter situation in our life and, and we look at the love of God that was displayed on the cross, we apply that to the bitterness of the situation, it makes it sweet. As, as we see the trial is going to develop a sweet characteristic in us. For example, James 1-2, James 1-2 says, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this is the trying of your faith, work with patience. Patience is sweet. So just as Moses had the choice, he could change those waters from being bitter to sweet by putting in that wood, that tree. We got a choice. We can change a bitter situation into a sweet one by seeing the same love of God that sent Jesus to the cross as using that hard situation to make us gain patience. But if we don't choose that, if we don't choose to convert the bitterness into a sweetness, then bitterness will lead to disobedience to God and his requirements for our lives. When we say, why do I have to do this? It's coming from bitterness. Bitterness will lead to ingratitude to God for what he's done for us, where we say, I don't need to thank God for what he's, he should be doing that for me. Bitterness will lead to a distrust in God by leading us in life to say, why doesn't God make this happen instead? Bitterness will lead to impatience with God, where we say, God could have done this sooner. This is all what the Bible calls a root of bitterness in Hebrews 12, 15. Hebrews 12, 15. Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby make thereby many be defiled. So the murmuring that we see in verse 41 is a root of bitterness against Jesus Christ. And the murmuring in verse 31 is springing up and many are being defiled as the murmuring is spreading like a cancer. And it was all over the fact that Jesus said that his origin was from heaven. Now, what we see, what we see where the murmuring is and this bitterness, it, 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 it took them and it went on to say, they went on to say in verse 42, verse 42, they said, is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How is it then that he saith, I came down from heaven? So when they said this in verse 42, is not this Jesus? They didn't say, is not this the Lord Jesus? They didn't say, is not this King Jesus? Kind of putting them down, putting that name down, really pushing that name down. They said, "Is not this Jesus?" And we can hear this disrespect in the name of Jesus as they said, it, "Not this Jesus." They were not saying Jesus is the sweetest name I know. He's just the same as his holy name. That's the reason why I love him so. Jesus is the sweetest name I know. They weren't saying that. They were not saying is not this Jesus in the spirit of Philippians 2.9, Philippians 2.9, wherefore God hath also highly exalted him and given him a name 
which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven, things in earth, things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. When they said, it's not just Jesus, they were justifying their position that Jesus did not come down from heaven, that Jesus came from earth. And so therefore they said in verse 42 that Jesus was the son of Joseph and that they knew who Joseph and Mary were. They took it for granted that Joseph was really his father, that only saw Jesus as a mere man. When they said in verse 42, it's not this Jesus, they raised a question that everyone's got to answer in life. And the question is, which Jesus do you see? Is it the Jesus they saw in verse 42, just the, 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 the man Jesus from earth? Or is it the Jesus who, who, who he said he was in verse 42, verse 42, I am the bread which came down from heaven? And the true answer to the question is, is not this Jesus, is Matthew 16, 15, Matthew 16, 15, he saith unto him, but whom say ye that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. The true statement is, is not this Jesus, but Christ, the Son of the living God. The false statement is, verse 42, verse 42, is not this Jesus, the Son of Joseph. So first they ask themselves the question in verse 42, is, is not this Jesus? And then they go on to clarify their question by saying, whose, mother, whose father and mother we know. Now, when they said this first part, whose father we know, they revealed their ignorance. They revealed the problem because they didn't know who the father of Jesus was. Jesus said in John 8, 19, John 8, 19, they said unto him, where's thy father? Jesus answered, you neither know me nor my father. For if you'd known me, you should have known my father also. So they said they knew his father, small f, father, the father of Jesus. And that was the problem. They didn't know the father, capital F, of Jesus. So when they said in verse 42 that they knew the father of Jesus, they were representing really the world view. They failed to they failed to understand the truth of Isaiah 7.14, Isaiah 7.14, which says, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and you shall call his name. God is with us. Emmanuel. They failed to understand what Adam and Eve understood, that the woman would be involved in the great birth of the man, who would be God, who's come in the flesh in Genesis 3.15, Genesis 3.15. God said uh, to Satan, I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. It, her seed, shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. And they understood, Adam and Eve understood that this seed of the woman would be God because God told them that in the middle of Genesis 3, Genesis 3.15, the middle of Genesis 3. And in the next chapter, Genesis 4, the first verse, when Eve had her first baby boy, she thought her child was God. When she said in Genesis 4.1, Genesis 4.1, Adam knew his wife Eve, and, and she conceived and bare Cain and said, I've gotten a man who is the Lord. In that verse, the Hebrew word et, better translated, who is. Now, in verse 42, when they said about Jesus, whose father, they said about Jesus, whose father we know, they didn't understand. Galatians 4.4, Galatians 4.4, when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son made of a woman. Not made of a man. Jesus was only made of a woman. He was not made of a man. Mary was his mother, but Joseph was not his father because the conception of Jesus was, Matthew 1.18, Matthew 1.18, now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise, when as his mother was a spouse to Joseph, before they came together, sexually, before they came together, she was found with child 
of the Holy Ghost. Matthew 120, Matthew 120. The angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of or from the Holy Ghost. They didn't understand 1 Timothy 3.16, 1 Timothy 3.16. God was manifest in the flesh. What they missed was that Jesus was the child that was born, who's called the mighty God, but he was the son that was given. The son was not born in Isaiah 9, 6. Isaiah 9, 6. For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor. The Mighty God. The Everlasting Father. The Prince of Peace. Jesus was not the son that was born. Because Jesus is the word of John 1.1. 1, 1. John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was made, was with God, and the Word was God. And then John 1.14, John 1.14, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. They didn't understand this. They didn't understand that Jesus is God the Son. They didn't understand that Jesus was conceived on earth by God the Spirit. They didn't understand that Jesus was God in the form of man. And that's why they didn't understand and asked this question in verse 42, verse 42. How is it then that he saith, I came down from heaven? So what we've got here is a scene that the people are murmuring over this question. How is it then that he saith, I came down from heaven? They're privately talking among themselves. They're not speaking to Jesus about this. They're speaking among themselves. But even though they were not speaking to Jesus, and they weren't asking Jesus this question, we read in the next verse, in verse 43, verse 43, Jesus therefore answered and said. Now, those words, they weren't talking to him. They weren't asking him. But he answers them in verse 43. They show us Jesus is listening and, and, and when you and I think that Jesus is not listening because, uh, because he's, we're, he's not here. Psalm 139.2, Psalm 139.2 makes it clear where David said, Thou knowest my down-sitting and my uprising, and thou understandest my thought afar off. When we think we're thinking thoughts, and that Jesus is a way far away from our thoughts, that's when... We, we, we get surprised by a verse 43, verse 43, Jesus therefore answered and said. These people were not asking Jesus the question in verse 42, verse 42, how was it then that he saith I came down from heaven? But even though they weren't asking Jesus that question, Jesus answered their question in verse 43, verse 34. Jesus therefore answered and said unto them. That's what happens with us. That's what Jesus communes with our thoughts. He's right there with us. Even though we're not praying to Jesus, he's listening to our thoughts and he's answering our questions even when we don't ask him for an answer. And this is what David meant in Psalm 139.2. Psalm 139.2, Thou understandest my thought afar off. He not only understands our thoughts, but he speaks to our thoughts. And that's why it's so important to live in the Bible, because that's the one place where, where Jesus speaks to our thoughts. Now, the answer that Jesus gave to their question, their question again in verse 42, how is it then that he saith, I came down from heaven? The answer he gave them in verse 33, 43, verse 43 is, murmur not among yourselves. There are truths that they could not figure out. And those are the same truths that we can't figure out. We can't figure out the miracle of the conception of Mary, that, the, that Mary was impregnated by God the Spirit. We can't figure out the miracle of the virgin birth. The vir a virgin giving birth. We can't figure out the miracle of God coming down from heaven to earth. We can't figure out the miracle of God becoming a man. We can't figure out the miracle of God the Son in the form of a man. We can't figure out God in the flesh, how he can take all of our sins loaded on him. We can't figure out how God in the flesh died on the cross for the sins of man. 
began to figure out the resurrection, we can't figure out those truths any better than they could figure out. So just as we see in verse, in verse 41 that they're murmuring among themselves, trying to figure out the miracle of God coming down from heaven to earth, we can also very easily slip into that state of murmuring, trying to figure out the miracles that God did. So when Jesus said to them in verse 43, murmur not among yourselves, Jesus was saying to them, stop it. Stop trying to figure out what you can't figure out. Miracles that God came down, for example, to earth from heaven in the person of Jesus. He's saying, what he's saying, stop it. Stop trying to figure out. And when we try to figure out the miracles of God, God says this is the same thing. Stop it. Verse 43, verse 43, murmur not. Instead of trying to figure out these miracles, we are called to a walk in life described in 2 Corinthians 5, 7. 2 Corinthians 5, 7, we walk by faith, not by sight. Walking by sight is trying to figure out. Walking by faith is to stop trying to figure out and just believe it's true because God said it. To walk by sight is to walk a life of, by figuring out, we understand. To walk by faith is to walk in a life of Hebrews 11.3, Hebrews 11.3. Through faith, we understand. Not by figuring out, we understand, but through faith, we understand, Hebrews 11.3. So when Jesus said in verse 43, murmur not, he's saying to them, stop with your life of through sight we understand and start with a new life of through faith we understand. That's Hebrews 11, 3 again. Now, in the next verse, Jesus addressed the greatest act of faith that a person can exercise which is verse 44, verse 44, 44, come to me. That's the greatest act of faith that a person can exercise, come to me. Now what is that? Coming to Jesus is an act of the soul. It's an act of faith. Coming to Jesus is a personal acceptance of the invitation that Jesus said, it, Jesus made this invitation, for example, in Matthew 11, 28, Matthew 11, 28, he said, Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Or when he said in John 7, 37, John 7, 37, 37, in that last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood up and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. Coming to Jesus is accepting his invitation. Jesus makes that invitation, which is extended by the Holy Spirit. The invitation is extended by the Holy Spirit, and the invitation is extended by believers to others, as we see in Revelation 22, 17. Revelation 22, 17. The Spirit and the Bride, those are believers, the Bride. The spirit and the bride say, come. And let him that is a thirst say, come. And let him that is a thirst come. And whosoever will, let him come, take the water of life freely. Coming to Jesus is accepting his invitation that he made as Jehovah Jesus in the Old Testament in, in Isaiah 55.1. Isaiah 55.1. Hold everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters, he that hath no money, come ye, buy, eat, drink, come, buy wine, milk, without money, without price. This is the first aspect of what it means to come to Jesus. It is to accept his invitation to come. But coming to Jesus is not just accepting his invitation to come, it is to obey the command to come. The command of Acts 16.31, Acts 16.31. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Coming to Jesus is to obey the command that Jehovah Jesus said in Isaiah 45.22, Isaiah 45.22. Look unto me, and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth. 
for I am God, there is none else. So coming to Jesus is to see the gospel, not just as a, as a, a warm invitation, but as a command that has to be obeyed. Coming to Jesus is to see the gospel command to be saved, which is 2 Thessalonians 1 8. 2 Thessalonians 1 8, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel, obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. So coming to Jesus is to follow the directions that he commands to receive eternal life. This is what he said. In verse 40, verse 40 of John 5, John 5, 40, John 5, 40. You will not come to me that you might have life. No one has any excuse for not coming to Jesus as even the creation extends this invitation for all men to come to Jesus. The Bible says in Romans 1, 20, Romans 1, 20, the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even as eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Those are important words. Without excuse. Those last words in Romans 1.20, without excuse means that no one has any excuse for not coming to Jesus. This is what makes Calvinism so wrong. Because Calvinism teaches that all men are so depraved that the only ones who can come to, to, to Jesus are the select few, elect, uh, predestinated, forward, etc. That God chooses and gives to only them a supernatural ability to come to Jesus. If Calvinism is true, which it's not, then a person can say, I have an excuse for not coming to Jesus. What's your excuse? My excuse is, I'm not part of the God-chosen elect who to get that special power to come to Jesus. I have an excuse for not coming to Jesus. Calvinism is horribly wrong because the Bible says that everyone in Romans 1.20, Romans 1.20 is without excuse. No one has any excuse. We're not coming to Jesus because God has given to each person the ability to come to Jesus. And that's why God punishes so severely those for not coming to Jesus in the 2 Thessalonians 1.8 verse, 2 Thessalonians 1.8. He punishes them in 2 Thessalonians 1.8 in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Calvinism is so terrible because Calvinism paints God as a horrible person who, according to 2 Thessalonians 1 8, 2 Thessalonians 1 8, takes vengeance with flaming fire for eternity on those who didn't come to Jesus, as Calvinism teaches they had no ability to come to Jesus. So the question that destroys Calvinism is how could God hold people responsible? and use flaming fire for eternity to punish them for not coming to Jesus when they had no ability to come to Jesus. In case you haven't noticed, I'm not a fan of Calvinism. <laughs> <laughs> to come to Jesus means to also turn from personal sin as seen in Jeremiah 3.21. Jeremiah 3.21. A voice was heard upon the high places weeping and supplications of the children of Israel. They're crying. For they have perverted their way. They have forgotten the Lord their God. Return, you backsliding children, and I will heal your backslidings. Behold, we come unto thee, for thou art the Lord our God. Coming to Jesus means to turn from personal sin. To come to Jesus is to ignore everything that stands in the way of coming to Jesus, even if it's family, even if it's friends. As Jesus said in Matthew 10, 34, Matthew 10, 34, think not that I am come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. For I am not, for I am come to set a man at variance against his 
father and the daughter against her mother and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's foe shall be they of his own household. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. He that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. To come to Jesus means to remove even self that stands in the way of Jesus, as he said in Matthew 10, 38, Matthew 10, 38, he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. To come to Jesus is basically to remove everything and anything that stands in life as a competitor with Jesus. Just like the hymn says, the hymn says, nothing between my soul and the Savior, not of this world's elusive dream. I have renounced all sinful pleasure. Jesus is mine, there's nothing between. Nothing between my soul and the Savior so that his blessed face may be seen. Nothing preventing the least of his favor. Favor, Keep the way clear, let nothing between. Nothing like worldly pleasure. Habits of life, though him, harmless they seem, must not my soul from him e'er suffer. He's my all, there's nothing between. Nothing between like pride or station, self-life or friends shall not intervene. Though it may cost me much tribulation, I resolve there's nothing between. Nothing between even many hard trials, though the whole world against me convene. Watching with prayer and much self-denial, I'll triumph at last with nothing between. Couldn't have said it better than that hymn. To come to Jesus means to feed on him. To feed on Christ is to feed on his word, as he said in Matthew 4.4, 4, Matthew 4.4. 4, he answered and said, it's written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Just like the Israelites, they fed on the manna in the desert. They were satisfied with this heavenly bread. Exodus 16.35, Exodus 16.35, the children of Israel did eat manna 40 years. To come to Christ is to make our souls satisfied with Christ. Psalm 35, 9, Psalm 35, 9. My soul shall be joyful in the Lord. It shall rejoice in his salvation. Isaiah said in Isaiah 61, 10, Isaiah 61, 10, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God. For he hath clothed me with the garments of salvation. He's covered me with the robe of righteousness. <clears throat> to come to Jesus means to trust Jesus in every situation of life. We oftentimes quote Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 as verses about trust. But it's what comes after those verses that clarifies what it means to trust in the Lord with all our heart. Proverbs 3, 5 says, Trust in the Lord, Proverbs 3, 5. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge you, and he shall direct thy path. Now comes the clarification. Be not wise in thine own eyes. Fear the Lord, be part from evil. It shall be health to thy navel, marrow to thy bones. Honor the Lord with thy substance, and with the first fruits of all thine increase. So shall thy barns be filled with plenty, and thy presses shall burst out with new wine. My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, neither be weary of his correction. For whom the Lord loveth, he correcteth, even as a father and son whom he delighteth. Happy is that man that findeth wisdom, and the man that getteth understanding. So those verses tell us what it means to trust in the Lord with all the heart. To trust in the Lord means to not lean to our own understanding. Don't try to figure it out. But, but walk by, don't, by, walk, don't walk by sight. Trust in the Lord means to believe God, just believe Him. Have confidence that what He says is true. Trust in the Lord, Lord means to see God in all parts of life and to openly acknowledge God and what happens to us in life. Verse 6, verse 6, in all that ways acknowledge Him. To trust in the Lord means don't be proud. Or don't be proud. Proverbs 3, 7, Proverbs 3, 7, 7. Be not wise in thine own eyes. To trust in the Lord means to, to, to give to God money, <clears throat> whatever, 
where, where God is trusted to replace it. Proverbs 3 9, Proverbs 3 9, honor the Lord with thy substance and with the first fruits of thine increase. So shall thy barns be filled with plenty, and thy presses shall burst out with new wine. You can tell how much a person trusts the Lord if you get a look at their checkbook. To trust the Lord means to, 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 to want to be led, to want to be corrected in life, to, to want the correction. Say, there's a lot of things that are wrong in my life. I need correction. Proverbs 3.11, Proverbs 3.11, My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, neither be weary of his correction. For whom the Lord loveth, he correcteth, even as a father and son in whom he delighteth. To trust the Lord is to never stop learning. Always coming to this book and saying, I need to learn more, I need to learn more, I need to learn. I don't know it. I don't know it. I, I told you about the experience that I had with, uh, with the Israeli uh, last week with Isaiah 53. And I said to him, I want to wipe the slate clear of my mind and pretend I never heard this chapter before, Isaiah 53. So tell me what it says. <clears throat> never stop learning from the Bible. Be happy with each new discovery. Proverbs 3.13, Proverbs 3.13, happy is the man that findeth wisdom and the man that getteth understanding. To come to Christ means to trust Christ as described in these Proverbs 3, 5 through 13 verses. Proverbs 3, 5 through 13. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much that we can, Lord, as the hymn says, we come, O Christ, to thee. We pray in Jesus' name. Thank you.